Welcome to FP Executive. I'm joined today by Cameron Heaps of Steam Whistle, co-founder of Steam Whistle Brewery in Toronto. Thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure, John. Uh, I've, we're here today to talk about the Richard Ivey uh, School of Business Quantum Shift Program for Entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And this is a very interesting program. They only let uh, about 40 entrepreneurs a year into the program, and you went through yeah. this in 2004. That's right. Yeah. Now, uh, KPMG, they selected you for the program? Yeah, KPMG uh, looks at across the country each year and uh, tries to select 40 promising entrepreneurs that have sort of just, they're not in the startup phase, but they have, you know, established a certain level of success mm -hmm. and bring them together in sort of a big think tank and try and, you know, uh, share ideas, but also arm those entrepreneurs mm -hmm. with some skills that will help preserve their businesses and help them to grow. Interesting. Well, I, I mean, Steam Whistle is, is a fantastic story, mm -hmm. uh, interesting brand. Uh, you went through the program in 2004. Do, do you, what do you remember from those classes, those quantum shift classes that has stuck with you? Well, I mean, I think uh, we were all a little nervous uh, going back to, back to school. Uh -huh. And uh, when we got in the classroom, it was very, very quick. You realize that this is going to be a classroom like you've never been in before because mm -hmm. because the all the fellow students are successful entrepreneurs uh, with mm -hmm. established businesses that's sort of the criteria is that you have to have some level of success to date and what we what you can learn from those people not just from the professors right and the, what they're arming you with but also in discussions with the people in the class was really amazing so it was it was uh, it sounds like the the learning environment was was really enhanced by the fact that you had top quality people in the class yeah absolutely uh, any lessons that you uh, that you remember specifically uh, in the class or from the other students that sort of stuck in your mind? Well, the, the main lesson I took away from Quantum Shift was um, Ivy had studied entrepreneur, entrepreneurial companies, startups, mm -hmm. and more specifically, fast growth startups, and had recognized that there was a bit of a problem that a lot of the most successful startup companies mm -hmm. became so successful mm -hmm. within growth rates, uh, very aggressive growth rates, that they eventually imploded and die okay. because they just couldn't adapt their companies to the level of growth. So mm -hmm. it was a real warning shot to everyone in the room to say, okay, you guys are all doing well, but you know, be very careful because as you get into the high growth phase, mm -hmm. you know, a company has to do an incredible amount of work to adapt its systems, its departments, mm -hmm. its strategy uh, to keep up and be able to survive through that level of growth. Did, it, did you change the way you did business after Quantum Shift? Well, I think a lot of uh, a lot of small business, well, all business people were were so incredibly focused on growth and how to grow and try and get more growth. Mm -hmm. And uh, with that, and what they sort of said is, you really got to balance that with, okay, be ready if that growth comes, right? Right. And how do you set your business up mm -hmm. so that you're ready for it? Because growth puts a lot of strain on an organization, mm -hmm. and that's when the cracks start forming, and that can often be mm -hmm. a crack that turns into something that will that will take down the company. I see. So it was really a, a, a the lesson I took away the most was how to step out of the business mm -hmm. and try and look at it from the outside with my partner mm -hmm. and figure out where those cracks are forming and address them before they turn into problems so that you can sustain that level of growth and continue to be a successful company. Interesting. So you were in a room with other business founders, other entrepreneurs. That's right. Um, how long was the program in, in 2004? Uh, it was a one-week program, but a, a one ve week. very intense. You're, you're pretty much it was 7 a.m. to 7 at night, and uh -huh. you're in class. Uh, and and, and you were able to deal with that. It was it was. I mean, for some, you mentioned going back to school. I mean, how did they accommodate people who you know you're out working, building a business, and all of a sudden you're stuck in the classroom? Well, that was sort of the, the prerequisite. Was you had to give up a week right. in order to go. Mm -hmm. You know, they didn't want anyone sort of coming halfway or right. leaving halfway. I mean, you had mm -hmm. to commit to the week. And uh, I mean, you're, you're put up in a dorm right. at the campus, so we had some fun. But it, it was very intensive. I mean, I think I went to more classes in that week of school than I went to in my whole undergrad. Really? Year. So it was really engaging. Mm -hmm. Did you talk much about branding in, in the class and marketing? Yeah, there was a, there was a branding element to it, but mm -hmm. uh, it was really largely driven at uh, how to sustain high growth. Right. So th this, is, this is program is really about, okay, so you've, you've developed your branding, uh, you're, you're on the path to success, mm -hmm. and it's how to stay on that path then. That was the, the largest focus. There right. were elements on, I mean, they bring in incredible speakers uh, right. as well as their top uh, professors mm -hmm. to talk about different elements, and one of them was branding. Yeah. Interesting. So um, now you mentioned how 
how good the class was in terms of other entrepreneurs there. Have you kept in touch with these people? Oh, absolutely, yeah. I keep in touch with a bunch of the uh, Quantum Shift fellows. And uh, they run a, an annual program as well where uh, alumni go back for a sort of condensed version on it. Mm -hmm. on uh, different different topics, as well as they run sort of quarterly programs right. uh, remotely through the KPMG offices. Interesting. Uh, so you, you used to get to stay in touch with them. So they're real characters. I mean, they, the, the, the typical entrepreneur tends to be a right. fairly colorful fellow. Have they, have they um, through that network, have you, uh, you know, continued to add value in, in essence through that those relationships over the years? Oh, abs I mean, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, some of the, the greatest resources you can have to tap into are you know, other entrepreneurs that might have dealt with an issue mm -hmm. that you're dealing with, they may have already dealt with it before, and you may have dealt with an issue they're dealing with. And to be able to exchange ideas in, you know, a relaxed social setting uh, yeah, is, absolutely. Is, is often what we do if we get together for a beer and mm -hmm. chat about business. Now, uh, people across the country will be uh, watching this uh, uh, brief video. Mm -hmm. And um, could you tell us a little bit more about Steam Whistle? I mean, it's located in Toronto. Mm -hmm. You're you're in a really sort of interesting, funky district. Mm -hmm. uh, you're a, a Toronto brewer, which is, yeah. is, is kind of fun. Um, what was the genesis behind Steam Whistle? Well, the genesis was my partner and I had worked in the beer industry for many, many years at a brewery my dad had opened called Upper Canada. Okay. Through a series of events, it had been acquired by Sleemans, and mm -hmm. we all got fired <laughs> and uh, went on to do some other stuff, got together on a, a camping trip. Uh -huh. A couple of years after that, and said, "Wow, mm -hmm. we got to get back into the beer business." Right. So we started uh, Steam Whistle Brewing, which was originally called Three Fired Guys Brewing. Oh, okay. The three founding partners had all been fired, and uh -huh. basically, we wanted to get into the beer industry and preserve a piece of Canadian brewing heritage. You know, ninety percent of the beer on shelf in Canada today's is made mm -hmm. by foreign-owned breweries, and our idea was we got to preserve a piece of this and try to establish a beer that can be l viewed as Canada's most respected beer. Because we are a great brewing nation, and if you ask mm -hmm. 10 people what Canada's best beer is, you get 10 different answers, and right. you won't necessarily get that in Holland or Ireland mm -hmm. or Germany, etc. So, so you, you, you've uh, sort of drawn on mm -hmm. the Canadian heritage mm -hmm. uh, of brewing beer, and also the fact that you guys love this industry mm -hmm. and you wanted to get back into it. Um, can, you, can you tell us a, a bit about you know, where your beer is distributed and, and the sort mm -hmm. of growth you've seen over the past few years? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're now distributed throughout uh, all of Ontario in mm -hmm. uh, beer stores, liquor stores, bars, restaurants, <laughs> and various events, and mm -hmm. then as well uh, throughout Alberta. Oh, okay, so you're in Alberta now. Yeah. Good. We've just gone into uh, BC, so you'll find some beer in the Lower Mainland. Oh, lovely. Yeah, and we've, uh, our idea is really to try and be a community brewery. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we don't put our money on billboards and TV ads. We right. we try and put it back into the community through various arts and cultural events mm -hmm. and communicate with our our drinkers and customers directly. Well, that's that's an interesting approach mm -hmm. to it because I mean we often as associate um, you know beer companies with you know huge advertising uh, mm -hmm. programs, be it in you know the NFL or whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, this is sort of community uh, uh, from the ground up approach. Um, what does that look like? Uh, can you give us some examples of how you sort of reach out uh, to your customers from the community level? Yeah, I mean, largely most of our marketing dollars goes towards supporting community events where mm -hmm. we may go out and send some of our staff, serve the beer, we get to interact and talk with those people, uh -huh. and as well we get to support these great causes around the city that uh, mm -hmm. you know are an in interest of uh, either an existing consumer or a potential consumer mm -hmm. and we have a lot of fun doing that Interesting. you know one of the great great sort of programs we have is with uh, independent canadian music where we oh. we host a big event at the brewery uh -huh. you know, every couple months and we bring in sort of the the, the what we view as the rising talent in the independent Canadian music scene, mm -hmm. and it's called unsigned. And the, the, the criteria is that n none of the musicians have been signed yet. Okay. And so we're trying to work with them and uh, raise their profile and help get them well, better their careers. And we view it as mm -hmm. you know, we're both underdogs. So. Right. I, well, I was just thinking that. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like a community of underdogs in a sense uh, right. and, and, and working together. Um, you talked about uh, Canadian heritage and beer. What's what? What does Canadian beer taste like? What should it taste like? I'm just curious. Well, I mean, for us, uh, we we want to compete with uh, the European pilsners because okay. that's a style that uh, you know was largely founded most of the Canadian breweries back mm -hmm. in the many many decades ago when a lot of Europeans were immigrating to Canada and bring mm -hmm. with them this great wealth of knowledge of how to make mm -hmm. uh, quality pilsner and that's what we're what we're about we're trying to compete with the best beers in the world and mm -hmm. most of those come out of Europe and our idea is well there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to do that in Canada mm -hmm. because beer uh, unlike wine doesn't is not made beside the field you know the, right. the, the ingredients mm -hmm. are brought 
uh, to to the brewery, and so we bring our hops from from Germany, or we bring mm. our our malt from Saskatchewan. We bring in natural spring water. We fly in our wow. yeast from Hungary once a year. Wow! And we use um, you know a Czech brewmaster who grew up uh-huh. uh, working at Pilsen Urquell, and we make it right here. So you That's can amazing. get the freshest, best quality beer in Canada wow. right here. Cameron Heaps, thank you so much for joining us uh, today. I think uh, we'll have to have a beer after this. A steam. All right, sounds good. Thanks so much. My pleasure, John. <laughs>